on the Alameda campus today. The, uh, the event was actually filmed for C-SPAN uh, Vogue TV. So you'll have the opportunity to watch it at a later time, and I think you'll hear some very lively and interesting debates. We also had on the panel some Grand Valley uh, professors, so they also contributed. So we had some local talent there as well. I think if you get the chance, I urge you to watch it. Uh, it will be uh, very, very interested to see what was said today. And what was argued, it was very lively. I also want to just say, since the Hallenstein Center for Presidential Studies was mentioned, I always want to, to draw attention to the inspiration and the vision behind the center, and that is Mr. Ralph Hallenstein in the first row and his wife Grace next to him. Thank you very much for your support of the Hallenstein Center and the emphasis to the Say the words, The West Wing, and most people think of the popular television series starring Martin Sheen. Well, that's Hollywood. If you want the real thing, you've come to the right event to hear tonight's distinguished speaker. Roger Porter comes to us by way of a very interesting career that has many connections with Grand Valley and with Grand Rapids. Grand Rapids is an integral part of the story. In fact, back in 1974, he met a man whose name is familiar to many of you. Bill Seidman was at the time one of Vice President Ford's advisors, economic advisor. He interviewed Roger Porter, who seemed to be a White House fellow. Well, Seidman was truly impressed with the young man opposite him, who at the time was on his way to earn a PhD in government and economics at Harvard. Roger Porter was selected, and he was told to report to the Vice President's office on a certain day. Well, they say timing is everything. Well, try this for timing. Roger Porter showed up for his first day of work on August 9th, 1974. Mm. Those of you who toured this museum know the significance of that date. It was exactly three hours before President Richard Nixon resigned. So there he is. All of a sudden, Roger Porter's boss was the President of the United States. Quite an entrance in the White House. From that propitious beginning, Dr. Porter would go on to spend a total of 11 years in the West Wing, serving Presidents Ford, Reagan, and Bush the 41st. He served mostly in senior economic policy positions, so I suppose we can give him some of the credit for the prosperity of the 80s and the 90s. When Dr. Porter was not in the West Wing, he was at Harvard, where he's currently the IBM professor of business and government. He teaches at the Kennedy School of Government, and I have it on excellent authority from Mark Jordan in the crowd tonight, that he is one of the best teachers there. Mark was a student of Rogers. In fact, I just learned that Porter teaches the most popular class in Harvard. It has the most demand uh, from the student body to get in this class. It's uh, on the American presidency. Dr. Porter is also a productive scholar. He is the author of several books on economic policy, including presidential decision making. One final note, Dr. Porter is a talented tennis player, and at one point was the best tennis player on the White House staff. <laughs> and one blessed day, he even defeated the champion of Wimbledon. So it is appropriate this evening to see the caliber of his ground strokes and volleys as he hits some ideas our way. I know we won't be disappointed, so please join me in giving a warm Michigan welcome to Dr. Robert Porter. Well, uh, Ralph Poundstein, Marty Allen, Cleves Whitney, several wonderful friends, uh, old it's a real pleasure for me to be back here in Grand Rapids. I, I should mention the tennis match that he's referred to was actually played here in Grand Rapids. I remember it well because my boss, Bill Seaton, was supposed to play in a tennis match here, uh, partnering with uh, a University of Michigan player uh, against John Newcomb, who was the Australian at one point, and 
Governor Milliken, who was then Governor of Michigan. And the day before the match was to occur, he came into my office and said, how would you like to go to Grand Rapids and play a tennis match? And I said, well, what, what's up? He said, well, I just got a special invite to a state dinner. This was on the 4th of July, 1976, and the Queen of England uh, was just in the United States. President Ford was having a state dinner, and Bill Seidman had gotten invited to it, and so I substituted for him. That was one of my happy introductions to uh, Grant Rappus, who was not here and play uh, against John Newcomb. Indeed, that was one of the things that uh, I used to enjoy doing with President Ford and how I met President Bush. And maybe I'll just tell one more story before leaping into this about that. I was uh, one of the younger people in the White House staff, and I had played collegiate tennis, and uh, it was still pretty quick in those days. And so President Ford used to love to have me as a partner. <laughs> so uh, I got a call one Saturday morning from his aide. He said, the President wanted to know if you'd be available to play tennis on Saturday morning at 1. I said, sure, but we playing? And he said, well, George Bush is just back from China, and he's going up to his confirmation hearing. He's a CIA director uh, next week, and the president knows how much he likes to play tennis, and thought he'd invite him over to play on the White House courts. So I said, great. Well, we get out on the courts, and, and I got there a little early this evening, and I don't want to be late for the engagement with the president. And, uh, George Bush had showed up. So I said, well, do you want to get some before uh, the other uh, parties arrived? He said, sure. We got out and started getting some. <coughs> and then we got into the match. Now, I don't know what you think is the nature of people who make it to the top in our American political system. <laughs> but I'm here to testify to you that they are intensely <laughs> President Ford would sometimes find himself in mid court and George Bush was slamming overheads directly at him. <laughs> and President Ford turned to me to get this point. And, uh, I, have, I have never felt as much pressure in my life <laughs> as when we were changing into the court by the four and I was to serve. President Ford hands me the ball and says, don't let us down. <laughs> anyway, I often wonder what would have happened because after the match was over, uh, President Ford went back and then George Bush hung around and he said, where did you learn how to play tennis? And I told him, he says, can you get this court? And I said, yeah. He said, well, if I make it through my uh, confirmation hearing, he said, can you get yourself a partner? I said, sure. And he said, well, if I make it through these confirmation hearings, um, and you can get this court, uh, I'll give you a call. I'm down the very next week, yeah, right after he was confirmed, he came down. His partner was Jim Baker. <laughs> <laughs> they won a couple of doubles tournaments in, in Houston. They were actually a very good team. And my partner was Bill Seaton. And we would, uh, we would play them uh, every week. We come in every week. It was going to be a lot of fun. Anyway, we've got to move on from ten stories. But uh, uh, the White House uh, now, as well as then, is in fact a fascinating place. Several weeks ago, uh, at a small dinner that former President Bush hosted at his Kennebunk Court home, his honored guest was former British Prime Minister John Major, who shared some of his views of the world and some of his reflections on leadership. He observed that we stand at a moment in time quite unlike any other. He asserted that never before has a nation not even wrong with the time of its empire, been so dominant as is the United States today. Militarily, economically, politically, the United 
United States has no genuine life. The former bipolar world, with a decades-long contest between superpowers and ideologies, has given way to a world in which the United States is uniformly recognized as the world's dominant nation-state. He observed that with great power comes great responsibility, and that this is a moment in history in which the United States can be a powerful force for good. He went on to assert that in the fall of 1990, former President Bush carefully constructed an international coalition that was broader and more remarkable its strength and diversity than any other in recorded history. This coalition won a decisive victory in the Gulf War during 1991. And he then said that during his years in office, he had had the opportunity of working with scores of world leaders. And that he did not know one who could have provided this leadership as successfully as did President George H.W. Bush. Now, Prime Minister Major's remarks reminded me and us of two important features of the presidency in the 21st century. The first is that the American president is more than a national figure. He is indeed a world leader. And his role as the leader of the United States is one that is pivotal in that he is the architect of our nation's foreign policy. The second thing we take from our minister major's remarks is that individuals count arguably as much as the institutions. Who occupies the presidency? Their will and their skill, their judgment and their integrity, in fact, do make a genuine difference. Now, it's very easy to become captured by the events of the day and the drama of our time. My purpose this evening is to try to step back and take a somewhat longer view of our current situation and seek to determine what are the best lessons that we can learn. When the United States was founded in the latter part of the 18th century, we were a relatively small nation. We had fewer than 4 million Americans, mostly huddled along the East Coast. Few Americans had penetrated very far inland. Uh, there were less than 200,000 who were politically active. As nations go in the world at that time, they were relatively insignificant. We spent most of the next century acquiring and developing the continent, protected by two large oceans and determined to avoid becoming entangled in conflicts elsewhere around the world, despite the opportunities for those who would like to look at our systems. Indeed, until that watershed year in US diplomatic history in 1890, <coughs> there is not one single occasion when the United States took a foreign policy action other than in its strict national interest. But with the decision in 1898 to go to war with Spain over Cuba because of the Spanish treatment of Cuba, we have had a struggle and a tension between these two great impulses that we have as a people, our realism and our idealism, our determination to act in our national and our eagerness to take ideas and spread them abroad. And I believe that historians of the 20th century, when they look back on it, will view it largely as a century in which the United States and her allies sought to 
to advance two principal ideas. The first great idea that we sought to advance was that democratic political institutions are the best way to govern a society. The second great idea we sought to advance is that market or economic arrangements are the best way to organize economic activity in a society if one's objective is the greatest prosperity for the largest number of people. And throughout the 20th century, we fought two world wars, one long extended Cold War. But in the marketplace of ideas, as the 20th century ended, freedom and free enterprise, democracy and capitalism, if you will, had triumphed in that marketplace. No longer would the United States be content simply to confine its attention, its energies, its resources, and its leadership to a single nation. But now we had to come to the age the world. Following the Second World War, we were instrumental in the creation of the United Nations, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund. The predecessor was now the World Trade Organization. Indeed, if you look at the resources available to the President of the United States and compare them with their counterparts, as I've had the opportunity, in London, in Paris, Berlin, in Rome, in Ottawa, in Tokyo, in Moscow, in Beijing, one discovers that the resources that are available to the American president are far more extensive and far more robust than that of any other executive around the world. I need not remind you that we have by far the most powerful military in the world. Sheer defense related spending will approach a little over $400 billion. That's about six times the next largest uh, military expenditure by the country, which is Russia. Economically, this year, with our gross domestic product at approximately $10.4 trillion, we will command 31% of the world's gross domestic product. Again, far in excess of that competitive Technologically, we, if you go in sector after sector of the economy, you discover that it is the United States that is the world leader. Culturally, uh, our universities, institutions of higher education are the premier ones in the world, attracting more than 700,000 students abroad who come to study in American universities, who listen to American French American films published. Truly, John Major was correct that the United States is in a preeminent position in the world. And the President of the United States is now at the heart of that set of responsibilities in providing world leadership. But it's not just a set of responsibilities with respect to the international arena that must concern the president. He also has a set of responsibilities with respect to domestic economic policy. In 1930, the federal budget was less than 3% of gross domestic product. This year, the federal government's budget will be in excess of $2.1 trillion. That is virtually close to 20% of our gross domestic product. The federal government now, by virtue of the choices that we have made as a people, supported by both of our political parties, plays a major role in our lives, providing a wide array of services and programs for the American people. And it is to the 
president that we look to for leadership in this country. Well, if we have this huge set of expectations with regard to the president and the role he is to play, let's consider for a moment the arena in which he must now operate. We don't have time uh, to go into great detail, but let me just briefly identify five things that tend to be major considerations for the president in seeking to respond to these two great goals as internationally domestically. The first is what has happened in the Congress. Look over the last uh, four years, we have discovered that power within the Congress is increasingly divided, distributed, abused. The majority system accounts for less than it did. Um, growth of staffs have made Congress, both personal staffs, committee staff, institutional staffs like the Congressional Budget Office and the uh, Research Division of the Library of Congress, have made Congress as an institution much less dependent on the executive for information and analysis. Members of Congress now spend more time in their districts, have a closer bond and tie to their individual constituencies. Now fully 45% of all congressional employees live within the state or district they come from, as opposed to going to Washington. Uh, we've, we've seen a sea change in terms of the attentiveness that members of Congress have to local constituencies. And as a result, this represents a major challenge for the presence in the task of negotiating with the institution in which its members have such close individual ties to their constituencies. A second feature of the landscape is that we have now moved into an era in which the division among the major political parties is exceedingly narrow. Um, the days when Franklin Roosevelt could uh, find himself reelected in 1936 and look out over a uh, United States Senate that had 78 Democrats and 18 Republicans has given way to an era in which we now have roughly equal numbers of Republicans and Democrats House and Senate was a slender Republican majority. But with the increased use of procedural devices, such as filibuster, uh, uh, which is now much more common than frequently resorted to in the past, uh, we find that getting things done and finding the people that you can negotiate with, if you are the money to, is more challenging. We've also seen a uh, significant growth in the number of political appointees that presidents have made and the growth of central staffs that give the presidents more power and more control or capacity to attempt to control activities all across their administration. Fourthly, we have seen a tremendous growth in the rise of organized interest groups, think tanks, and entities outside of the formal government structure, filled with people who have ideas and who have undertaken analysis and who represent constituents and who insist quite legitimately for a place at the table. And finally, we have had the rise of the media and a press establishment which is larger, more competitive, more pervasive. We will remind you that when John Kennedy became president in January of 1961, we had three television networks, each of which broadcast for evening news pro 
Logan, black and white, about 15 minutes in length. <clears throat> now we have the 24-hour news cycle in which you can not only tune on with C-SPAN's book notes, and I encourage you to uh, you can follow James Whitney's uh, advice and tune in on the excellent sessions that were held earlier today. But any time of the day or night, a lot of insomniacs in the United States are going to A lot of people tell me they saw something on at 3 o'clock in the morning, and uh, why didn't I comb my hair better? But at any rate, we have got, we have got a, 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 a situation now in which what presidents do and the immunity in which they play is much more visible much more transparent uh, in which what they do and what they think, decisions they make, are very much more than what Now, they have much greater capacity to communicate and uh, to try to, to reach out. But it is, a, it is a different and in many ways a more challenging set of arrangements in which we now expect exercise the leadership and one. Well, uh, let's turn our attention for a moment to George W. Bush, uh, the subject of this uh, symposium and the excellent volume uh, that has uh, just been published uh, considering the Bush presidency. It's her volume, the first one uh, is out on this subject with a collection of truly outstanding Scholars, I just glanced over it quickly, and I'm looking forward to reading it in great depth. But what are we to make of um, George W. Bush's presidency so far? Well, uh, there is not time to explore every avenue, so let me look at three aspects of it with you before we open up. One of the aspects that I look for in the president is how they begin and the kinds of people with whom they surround themselves. If you work in the West Wing for very long, I have the privilege of working there for considerable periods of time, you discover how much is done in the president's name. Many decisions flow from the people who are immediately around them. One of the questions that interests me most as a voter in trying to decide whom I want to support sit in the Oval Office is the kind of people with whom they surround themselves. And there are many people in life who feel uh, slightly threatened by strong minded strong-willed, intelligent people. They choose instead to surround themselves with people who will be uh, subservient, who will tell them what they want to hear, who will salute smartly, carry out their instructions quickly. Who are not going to give them a lot of pushback. One of the things that greatly impresses me about George W. Bush is the people that he chose to surround himself with. I do not feel at liberty to go into detail uh, about his courting of Dick Cheney to be his vice president. Um, but I have known Dick Cheney from that very first day that I was sitting in. Administration, and uh, he clearly did not see his job. He had to be persuaded over an extended period of time to take it as vice president. In my experience, there are few people who are more analytically clear and soundly reasoned in a meeting. 
fact that he was prepared to live the life that he loved uh, as uh, chairman and CEO of a major corporation and everything he wanted to in a public life that he feel the need to do. That he could be persuaded uh, to leave that behind and to run for the vice presidency when he knew that this was not a stepping stone that he was going to be on as any vice president would be as cold and free uh, mind that it will be. I think it's quite remarkable. The fact that he could have tried to go in the house and Don Rumsfeld on his rise and others tells me a great deal about his style of leadership and his comfort level and surrounding himself with good people. Now it's interesting to note the types of people that he chose to surround himself with. Because presidents in recent years have tended to come with little, if any, Washington or international experience. Think about it. The first six presidents that we have Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, and John Quincy Adams, all have been active participants in national endeavors. Washington is the commander in chief of the forces. Adams, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, and John Quincy Adams, holding numerous offices uh, on the national stage. Four of them in succession having served as Secretary of State. They not only knew Washington the federal government, but they knew the international arena in a truly remarkable way. And since 1976, the 1976 election, we have only had one president, George H. W. Bush, who had extensive Washington experience. For instance, in international experience. And instead, chosen people, living governors, Carter, Ronald Reagan, Bill Clinton, and George W. Bush, without Washington experience. And indeed, people who ran against Washington, either because it was the tool of special interests, or because it was a place filled with gridlock, or a place that required greater civility, or overseeing a government that had grown too extensive and bad. And isn't it interesting to note <coughs> the way in which George Bush decided to populate his administration? very consciously and deliberately, I made it clear to them that I was not in a position to come back to a, a terrific situation during the course of the transition because you can be a truly disinterested. I promised several people that I've been going three times and every time we had gone in, or I had gone in together, we had had a recession within the first <laughs> one months. So I promised friends who were very concerned about this that I was through it and do it again. Sure enough, we had a recession, and it wasn't my fault this time. So I, uh, I uh, claim that this was in the past this sheer coincidence. But at any rate, uh, I found it very interesting to see that in a highly truncated transition, that remember that the, the, the outcome of the election wasn't known for 36 days. So instead of having the traditional 11 weeks, you effectively only had a six week transition uh, for this group. They managed to put together a remarkable group of people who came from two reservoirs. One were people who had indeed a great deal of governmental and specifically Washington experience. People who knew the levers of power in Washington well, who were veterans, who had performed their jobs or very similar jobs previously. Dick Cheney's, Don Rumsfeld's, Colin Powell's, Amy Cards, Hunter Lee's Rice, uh, etc. And 
then you had a group of people who knew the governor, George W. Bush, well from their exposure to him in Texas. His two campaigns for governor, six years that he served as governor, and then his presidential campaign. People like Carl Rowe, Karen Hughes, Clay Johnson, And as a result, uh, he had the benefit, the same kind of benefit that Ronald Reagan had. The group of people who he knew well and felt comfortable with, and the group of people who knew the levers of power in Washington well. Many people are under the impression, one might say, illusion, that presidents tend to surround themselves with people who think very much like they do, and who give them advice which is within a fairly narrow range. I know from my experience and from extensive discussions with people who are part of this administration that that is simply not the case. The discussions are very robust within this administration. Strong people express, expressing strong points of view encouraged by a president who wants and welcomes them. I have a theory that presidents get almost exactly what they want in the way of advice. If they are comfortable tolerating differences in opinion and perspective and agreement and hearing those argued out both on paper and in person, they get it. And if they send signals Assure you that people around them are extraordinarily sensitive to the signals, subtle and overt, that the president sent, that they get exactly what they want in return. And in interviewing large numbers of people within this administration, talking with many of whom I had the opportunity to work with in the past, one of the things that they consistently mentioned is that President Bush enjoys the give and take uh, of uh, argument um, over ideas on um, his appointees. Now it is all very civil and very polite. It's not personal and vindictive. And the reports that you read of these types of things in the press are greatly overdrawn. But in the meetings themselves, he is exposed to the full range and people, and that is very important. Let's turn to a second uh, element of his presidency, uh, the relationship that he has sought to establish with Congress. When um, he served as governor of Texas with a democratically controlled legislature, he quickly established a close relationship with the Democratic Lieutenant Governor Bob Bull. And he determined that he was more interested in getting things done than in winning arguments. And that he would try to reach across the aisle and fashion coalitions that could produce results. And having succeeded in doing that in Texas, he was determined to bring that same spirit to Washington. I think his interest in this was and is genuine. And that was the approach that he started out with. Some presidents make the mistake of trying to do too much too soon and discover that their troops are deployed on too many fronts, <clears throat> that they are engaged in too many battles, often in arenas not of their choosing times not convenient to them. The great presidents are those who focus their attention, who pick their battles carefully, who conduct those battles on terrain of their choosing and the time of their choosing. And so at the outset of the administration sought uh, to have a very focused agenda. Uh, looking first 
complete. You remember the first three weeks, the first week was on education, the second week was on tax uh, cuts, and the third week was on faith-based initiatives. And he negotiated um, with Senator Kennedy, invited him down to the uh, White House uh, orders that were coming in the those early days, um, the No Child Left Behind education bill. He was successful in pushing through his tax reduction effort. That fuel back from 1.6 billion, which was a trillion, which was his initial proposal of 1.3, but the structure of it was identical uh, in almost every respect to what he had proposed. All for individuals, none for business. The business community was out of pocket when that went and discovered that he actually meant what he said. We 
we look to the president to help establish for us a sense of priority of what we should have as a nation. Since the events of September 11, 2002, we have been shaken from what might be called a comfortable complacency that easily settled in the wake of the end of the Cold War. And of the period in which equity prices seem to be going up at double digit levels uh, year after year. But as that eminent economist Kurt Stein once remarked, if something can continue indefinitely, it won't. <laughs> and in fact, it did not. And so now we find ourselves in a very interesting situation. President Bush has now committed his administration and the nation under his leadership to a war on international terrorism. This is a war that is quite unlike any other war that we have ever fought. It is a war in which there are not clear demarcation lines, not one in which armies and navies and air forces clash over the seas or in the air or on the land. It is a war in which nation states are not arrayed against one another but in which well-financed and highly organized groups of people seek to challenge the lives and the legitimacy of nation states around the world. It is a difficult type of war because you are never quite sure how safe you are abroad or at home, or how long you will last or how much it will cost. In that sense, for a political figure, it is a very high risk, high stakes endeavor. And one of the things that is the hallmark of President Bush's administration is that with no hesitancy, with no equivocation, he has declared that the United States is going to lead this war. It is a war that will require him to muster an international coalition if it is to succeed, because that's the only way to effectively move on terrorism around the world. It is a war which will require great patience on the part of the American people, uh, who are not by nature an inherently patient group we like results. We are very efficiency conscious. We like to win. And we like to win now. And it will be a great test of his leadership, not only in the coming year, and if he is reelected in four years, to teach and educate, as all presidents must, the value of this war and to lead uh, our forces uh, of all types uh, in its conduct. There is a second challenge that is looming, which most of you are well aware of, which right now is not receiving the attention that it deserves the attention the domestic challenge that we face. The challenge that we and most of the rest of the developed nations with respect to entitlement programs. Programs that were adopted over the last roughly 60 years to enhance the security of our citizens. Whether that be health security, retirement security, or job security. This last 70 year period has really been the first time in the history of the world in which nations have been affluent enough to provide large measures of security for their citizens. <coughs> and most of us applaud this. And we want to live in societies in which we are taking care of the basic material needs of all our citizens. <coughs> but the reality is that the 
these programs were adopted using a set of demographic assumptions, as you would cost always to set up such programs, and financed on a pay-as-you-go basis. Now, there is nothing inherently wrong with a program financed on a pay-as-you-go basis, as long as the people contributing in relative to the people drawing out remains roughly constant. But that, let me underscore, that happy reality is we are living longer. The older I get, the happier I am. <laughs> and yet we're not only living longer, we're living healthier. If you have to have a problem, this is a great problem. But the simple reality is that we are like a plane that has taken off. There's nothing wrong with the plane. There's nothing wrong with the pilot. We have plenty of fuel on board. There's nothing wrong with the flight plane. There's nothing wrong with the destination. There are no terrorists on board. There is no mechanical failure that we are experiencing. There is no one trying to set us up. There are no conspirators. But once airborne, the demographic winds started blowing. And we have been blown, of course. Now, any pilot will tell you that when you discover you were off course, you made a mid course correction. When? Well, as soon as possible. Because the longer you keep flying off course, the sharper and more severe the course correction will be taken. And the great challenge that faces domestically, that faces President Bush and his administration and us as a nation, is how we are going to successfully make that mid course correction before the 77 million of us affectionately known as baby boomers start becoming eligible for these programs. Well, I have laid out um, what may well seem to be, uh, I hope and trust you in the group, a relatively sober yet optimistic view of the world and of his presence. George W. Bush came into office with very little Washington experience. Of all the Bush children, he spent the least amount of time Washington. Very close to his father, he used to talk about the only great deal while his father was president, but he loved Texas and wanted to stay there. And he has now become president at a crucial time, <coughs> a time in which he will face a serious foe abroad and in which he face a great challenge at home. In the past, Americans have looked to the president to help meet those challenges. And I think it is fair to say, I hope the presidential conservatives and the audiences will agree with me, that most of the time, the presidency has tended to bring out the best in those who are bought to my families. And through them, they have helped us as a nation hope and expect that that may be a lot this time. Well, thank you very much. And, uh, you know, have a Insight. 
us into how I think he's changed. He has become um, an extraordinarily disciplined and determined individual that Bob President. Um, during his first 40 years, I don't think discipline would have been the first characteristic <laughs> that most people would have associated with him. Uh, he went through a transformation at that stage in his life, and uh, his last 16 years have been quite different. Before September 11th, he would run on his treadmill over in the residence three miles a day. Out on the road, running three miles a day there. Uh, at uh, seven minutes and 30 second clips, maybe second miles. I don't know those of you who are runners, um, but there are not too many people 56 uh, years of age who run at that pace. By the way, when you run with him, he expects you to keep up. <laughs> and uh, he does not wait around if you don't keep up with him. He's in the well above the 99th percentile for people his age in terms of just sheer physical fitness. Following September 11, he upped that to four miles a day at 750 miles. This guy finds exercise as the way in which he um, gets rid of the stress. Um, he uh, jokes a little less now with those around him. A little more sober, a little more somber. Um, last time I saw him was uh, about nine weeks ago. Um, he's, he's serious. He realizes that we as a nation are in for a um, a great battle and a great struggle. I think he is more confident. And I, and I realize this is elusive, but when you're around people, you can sense how confident they are. And I believe he was transformed in a fundamental way when he was a governor of Texas. And I think he has been transformed a second time as president. You know, being president of the United States is just unlike any other job. You may think you're ready, and you may think you're prepared, but when you become president, it is my people do not treat you the same. Jim Baker is probably George Bush Sr.'s closest friend. I was in hundreds of meetings, and I never once heard Jim Baker refer to him as anything. Mr. President. Um, people other than your immediate family and spouse treat you differently because you're the president. And I think that he has come to the conviction that he is up to the job and that he does not question uh, once he has amassed all the information. I got talk to a lot of people who sit in decision making meetings with them all the time. You know, things I like study decision making about how he is as a decision maker. One is that he's he is very confident I I like that quality that's one of the ways in which he has uh, strengthened the portfolio of skills that he has. Are we, as President Nixon said, all Keynesians now, or are we all Chicago now? Or have we just given up and gone back to old-fashioned pork barrel economics? <laughs> well, um, unfortunately, uh, there are not enough hours left in the day to give a complete answer to that question. Um, the 
there are few things as frustrating to presence as economic policy because they instinctively, as well as rationally, understand that if there's anything that affects their electoral chances, it's how well the economy is performing. You can be a great wartime leader, and you can be a wonderful fellow, you can be a charismatic speaker, but if the economy is in a tank, people are going to be unhappy. And if you look at incumbent presidents who have lost in their bids for re-election, uh, whether it was President Ford in 76, or President Carter in 80, or President Bush in 92, you discover that it's not that people didn't like them and didn't think they had great character or had particular problems with their policy, but there was a perception that the economy was in Presidents know this, and they are very frustrated that the economy is very difficult to time. If policymakers knew how to time the economy well, it would always be coming at the time of elections. So presidents tend, in my experience, to err on the side of doing those things that their advisors tell them are most likely to help provide some oomph to the economy uh, at the time that they are going to stay in the election. As a result, we have now moved ourselves into a situation where we have got uh, budget deficits, at least in the foreseeable future, at a much higher level, which makes it look like the uh, the question you're asking are we all Keynesians and how it certainly looks to be that way. Um, the administration is making a sustained effort to convince uh, others that they recognize the difference between the short run and the long run. And the question is, can you get economic growth up to a level and revenues up to a level? that if you were able to restrain the growth of government spending, that you will, in fact, be able to return to an era of balanced budgets. The great problem for George W. Bush is the same problem that Ronald Reagan had. At the same time, we are trying to restore fiscal discipline. We have, in the instance of Reagan, the desire for a military buildup in order to negotiate with strength against the Soviet Union. In President Bush's case, we've got the situation where you're trying to uh, deal with a threat from abroad in the form of international terrorism, which is requiring a great deal more in expenditure with respect to homeland security, as well as with respect to the prosecution of the uh, complex in Afghanistan, Iraq, and the rebuilding of Iraq uh, that put at conflict uh, the goals and objectives that you have which is one of the challenges of life. We cannot maximize all the things and things. And we'll see how well these people make those choices. A couple more questions. What mistakes has this administration made? Well, um, that's a highly personal question in that what I might consider to be a mistake that uh, others might not, but let me give you a couple of candidates uh, that I have or decisions that I think um, I would have made them differently had I been with me. Um, Ralph Waldo Emerson uh, once observed, what you do rings so loud in my ears that I cannot hear what you say. Uh, all parents remember that. You <laughs> see trying to counsel the children. They tend to look at your example as much as at your preaching. <clears throat> and we are at a very critical stage in the global economy where we are trying to keep one of the great engines <coughs> that's been pulling us down the path of prosperity, which is to increase uh, trade between nations and to get the benefits that come from allowing each nation to produce most of what it produces best. We have been in the vanguard for the last 50 years in reducing barriers to 
trading on world money came back. And mind you, that in 1950, global trade was $70 billion. And since then, global trade has been growing at about 6.7% a year and compounded for 50 years, or growing about 50% more rapidly than the global economy. It's truly been one of the huge benefits in producing a 50-year period in the world's economic history that's unlike any other 50-year period at any time in the history of the world. Truly remarkable. <coughs> now the question is, are we going to sustain it? Are we going to get other people to join with us in saying, yes, we need to continue down this path and continue to reduce the barriers? And it's very hard to get people to go along with you unless they see you acting consistent with your rhetoric. Therefore, the steel decision and the farm, uh, farm Security Act, we put security in every bill that can possibly be there, where we dramatically increase the level of subsidies. I think, uh, now there, there are a whole host of reasons for why one might want to do it. But in, in, in my experience, I think both of those were decisions that I find questionable not merely on economic risk, but also because they create a precedent which makes the achievement of your other goals and objectives more difficult. Uh, and we will find out in a very short period of time what he's going to do on the second steel decision. Because now the whole issue is being raised in the new administration. Are we going to continue? Most economists conclude we've probably lost about 200,000 jobs in industries that use steel because of the protection that we have provided, which have increased uh, the prices for the steel that has to be used in the result. It's been a net job loser. The uh, fact that the steel workers came out in support of the Democratic candidate for the president probably uh, did not advance their cause either. But anyway, uh, those are the two candidates that I've been about. Dr. Porter, this uh, next question requires you to look into a crystal ball. Who do you expect to be the Democratic nominee in 2004? And what issue will dominate the 2004 election? Well, um, I, I have no pressing uh, crystal ball with the Democratic nominee. I'm just, just give two observations about how I think that party is going. In part, it depends on how badly the Democrats want to win. And parties always have to make up their mind. Uh, do we think we got a realistic shot this time? Do we want to win, or are we going to stand on principle? Okay. Republicans faced that choice in 1964. Uh, and uh, in uh, 2000, the Republicans haven't been out of power for uh, eight years, decided being out of power is not as fun as being in power. And I don't know if you notice how quickly Republican leaders from all around the country rallied to the banner of George Bush because they believed he was the most electable person. I think they were correct that he was the most electable person in the group. Now, the Democrats have not won a presidential election with a candidate who did not come from the South since John Kennedy won in 1960. That's 44 years. Um, the Mondales and Dukakis and the Governors are not where the country is. And if they want to win, then you're going to have to have a candidate that is going to be able to appeal to that portion of the electorate that is not either solidly Democrat or solidly Republican. The only way that they have managed to do that in the last four and a half decades is by advancing people like Lyndon Johnson and Jim Carter and Bill Clinton who could have that broad appeal. Now the problem is that the people who select the party candidates tend to be those who go out to the polls in primaries which tend to be those who are the most activists. And the activists 
are not necessarily representative of the group of people who are going to be going to the polls in November in the general election. And so among activists, you now see a huge boomer for Howard Dean. Now, I know Howard Dean from uh, in the days when we served on a commission together, uh, the uh, Education Goals Commission. I mentioned a couple of us administration. He's a very <coughs> pleasant fellow to be around. He's very smart. Uh, he's very energetic. Well, if you have research, I, do, I do not think if I were a Democrat and trying to pick a candidate that I would think he would be uh, the best candidate to run uh, nationally. Now, from the field, don't ask me. Maybe you can say, well, yeah, well, not how it being who. Um, because I don't see anyone there right now <coughs> that I think is going to be able to build a plan of momentum. That and knock off President Bush if the economy is healthy. However, if the economy is not healthy, then I think he could suffer the fate of the President and the President's duty. And people reach the point where they conclude he's had his chance, gave him the opportunity, we're not comfortable with the results, we want to change. Most elections are retrospective. Most elections are, should we give this person another chance? The last 12 elections, we had an incumbent president or an incumbent vice president on the table. And uh, the ones who win are the ones where people are satisfied with the shape. And we're willing to go another four years down this path. Once we may lose, with the single exception of Al Gore, we have other problems that I think uh, are his chances. But um, the other, one other thing uh, I should mention in this regard: the last hundred years, we have only had one occasion when a party has managed to capture the White House and not hold it for two elections. Jimmy Carter got defeated in 1980. All the rest of the time, the Republicans won 1900, 1904, 1908, the Democrats won 1912, 1916, the Republicans won 2024, 2028, the Democrats won in 32, 36, 40, 44, and 48. The only time when a party was able to hold it more than three consecutive times. Then the Republicans won in 52 and 56, the Democrats in 60 and 64, the Republicans in 68 and 72, the Democrats in 76, and then the only time in this last century, Democrats couldn't hold it for two elections when they were breaking in Carter, then the Republicans held it in 80, 84, 88, the Democrats in 92 and 96, and then you can, you can usually always hold it too. And then in 2000, the Republicans won. And that's one of the things George Bush had to face when he was running in 1992. The Republicans now won three in a row. He was now trying to make it four in a row. But we sort of have this feeling. It's, it's almost like a gut feeling. Well, okay, they've had their turn. And now it's the other guy's chance. <laughs> and uh, that was one thing that Bush was doing. So that's one thing that George W. has got in his paper. Is that he's only been there for one term. Let's give him a couple of times. <laughs> Well, this last question will we'll end on a light note. Which president was the most fun to work with? <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> um, well, I had the good fortune of working for three presidents, all of whom were individuals that I could genuinely admire. I cannot imagine what it would be like to work 14, 15, 16 hours a day for someone who you couldn't really admire. Um, my heart broke for friends of mine who worked in the previous administration who were told things by their boss that were not true. I can only imagine uh, the depth of their feelings when they woke up. Discovered that they had not been leveled with. So I had.
had a great good fortune. I worked with those people who I would have as role models for our children at any time. I was at a different stage in my life with each of them. They were at different stages in their lives. Um, but I will end with one fun story uh, that gives an example of how presence can be people. This was um, after Saddam Hussein had invaded Kuwait. It was in late August of 19. And President Bush uh, was up at King Bunkport. <coughs> but presidents never go on vacation. This notion that presidents go on vacation, their vacation is not like at least the vacations that I hope you take and that I like to take where you really just kick back and relax and you don't have all this business going on. Well, he had had a succession of world leaders coming up and visiting him in Bunkwood. And the call came down, oh, the press thinks he's concentrating all on, on foreign affairs and we've got to do something on economic and domestic policy. So they said, well, you and Darwin come up and do a briefing, a day-long briefing, two days from now. So we got together put together a great long group, including on health care, and we made most of the decisions in it. We're, we're already at that stage. This notion that is out there in the public, which is absolutely, totally wrong, that Bush came up with a health care plan in the wake of Thornburg's defeat in the midterm, uh, the off election in 1990, it's just absolutely wrong. I mean, we made actually most of the decisions that it was a very long day in August. Well, anyway. I come into the White House that morning. I'm dressed like I am now. I don't know what I was thinking in my, my head, but okay, show up, go to the White House. And we went out to the airport, flew up to Boston, rented a car, and drove up to Ken Bunkwood. As we were parking, I said, Darwin looks a little casual, because he was wearing, you know, uh, khaki pants and shirt. I didn't, it just didn't register to me that we were going up to his. No, I've been up to King about four many times, but I, I just, I wasn't, I guess I wasn't really thinking. Well, when I came through the door of his residence, he noticed me. Now, if it had been Ronald Reagan, he would have never said a word. He would have never said, oh, aren't you a little overdressed? I mean, he would have been very polite. But George H.W. Bush saw me coming through the door, just like that, recognized him. gets up, intercepts me before I can come into the room, takes me by the arm, walks me back into his bedroom, <laughs> starts pulling open the drawers, <laughs> and he says, what color do we like here? Um, and, and he pulls out the thing and he says, and said, it's a, it's a turn line shirt, and he says, he says, how's this? How's this? And I said, oh, well, it's fine with me. And he said, here, why don't you put this on, because we're going to put in to some horseshoes later in the day, and you'll feel more comfortable. He didn't say anything about, you know, the idiot, why are you overdressed for this occasion? He, but he immediately sensed the circumstance. And eager to save me from the awkwardness of being the only person in the room in a suit, he took it into his own hands to help me remedy what turned out to be a relatively modest faux pas on my part. And so in that sense, he's he, he is really, and, and George W. is the same, they're really an enormous amount of time. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. What a treat. This day has just been great. It was just kept brilliantly. We appreciate so much your coming and sharing the wisdom, the anecdote, all, all the wonderful stories that you have with us. I want to remind you, we have Punch out there, which you probably could all use while I'm getting punchy. We have, uh, I think, Dessert out there. And also there are books to uh, sign. So let us adjourn. <laughs>